Um, I am Jonathan Plett. I'm the current president of the AMS, and it is my pleasure to uh, welcome today Ian Dickey, who is going to be giving um, our monthly seminar. Um, and I love Ian's quote on his website where he says that over 95% of ecology looks at less than 5% of the species, and he loves looking at the what other people don't. And I remember meeting Ian oh, about a decade ago now, I guess it would be, and he really challenged me. Um, at that time, I was very much um, working in artificial systems to think about the ecology and, and to think about where I could go and how I would use what I'm learning in a, in, um, a Petri dish to apply that to ecology. I think also one of my favorite examples from Ian is how you sample within the field. Um, and one of the pictures I remember is of a cow pat. And do you sample in the cow pat or do you sample beside the cow pat? always challenging our thoughts. So thank you very much, Ian, for uh, agreeing to talk to us today, and I will pass it over to you. Thank you very much. I can't believe you raised the uh, the cow pat. It was a, a moment of great pride when I got that published in the journal. Um, so uh, uh, let's see if I get the slides to work here. Um, so my name is Ian Dickey, and I'm a professor at the University of Canterbury, professor of microbial ecology. I also do work through Bioprotection Aotearoa, which is a research institute. What I want to talk today to you about today is vegetation change and how that's influenced by and influences fungal networks. And when I use the word networks, it's kind of a loaded word. Um, it's got lots of different meanings. Uh, sometimes people talk about common mycorrhizal networks. Um, I'm not going to talk about those today. Uh, we can think about networks as being mycelial networks, uh, which is the actual physical network of fungal hyphae in the soil. Um, and again, I'm not really going to address those. I'm going to look at two other meanings of the word network, and those are interaction networks. So interaction networks are when two organisms share a partner, then an increase in, that, in one species can affect the other by changing the shared partner, whether that's a mutualist or a pathogen or an herbivore. Um, so those are interaction networks. And then related to that is the idea of co-occurrence networks. And that's um, uh, co-occurrence networks are frequently analyzed by microbial ecologists to look at what species occur at the same time and place, but they don't necessarily assume that they interact. Um, and mostly I'll be thinking about co-occurrence networks in terms of diversity, in terms of how many species are present, uh, which I'll call that alpha diversity for species present in one spot. And then I'll refer to maybe a little less familiar concept called beta diversity, which is the heterogeneity of communities. How much does the diversity change as you move from one spot to another? Now, I do like to challenge people, as, as was alluded to. So um, a lot of ecologists tend to study intact, beautiful native ecosystems and think about networks in these systems. And that's not where we're going to go today. Um, instead, we're going to go to the much more common ecosystems that dominate the world today which are dominated by exotic plants. Um, so I'm gonna look at areas of land use change uh, where we've modified the vegetation. And then I'll look at another human uh, change in vegetation, which are invasive plant species and the role of fungi uh, in these exotic dominated landscapes. And so those will be the two topics of today. We'll actually start with invasions, looking at fungal networks and invasion. Um, and when you think about invasions, there's a sort of concept out there uh, that ex that plants occur in their na natural environment with lots of herbivores, lots of pathogens, lots of endophytes, lots of mutualists. But when we take that plant and we move it to a new place, say a North American pine tree, and we move it to New Zealand or Australia, um, we might expect that it leaves a lot of those enemies behind. And so that concept has been called enemy escape. And the expectation would be that exotic plants would have fewer pathogens. At the same time, we might expect that mutualists could be left behind. Uh, so I've referred to that as mutualist limitation, uh, the idea that an exotic plant might be limited by a lack of compatible mutualists. So to explore that, I'm gonna start um, a sort of madcap chase through a whole bunch of studies. Uh, what I decided to do in my talk today is just touch on a whole series of different studies that have gone on and then see where the commonalities are between those. So the first one we'll look at is this one by Jeff Diaz that I was lucky enough to be involved with. And Jeff looked at this idea of soil feedback. So soil feedback is the idea that when you grow a plant, it can either make the conditions more favorable or less favorable for its own growth. Jeff went out to this site, which is in uh, Horamaka Banks Peninsula, um, near where I live. It's a fairly heavily degraded ecosystem. Uh, 
through land use change, exotic species invasions and um, disturbance. And he sampled a whole range of exotic species. Then each exotic species, he either grew in soil that had been cultured under that species, which we we'll call home soil, or soil from other species, which we we'll call away soil. And what he found was that in every single case, every exotic species he looked at, the growth in the home soil was worse than the away soil, sort of contradicting the enemy escape hypothesis, suggesting that there are, that these exotic species do have a lot of pathogens in the system, reducing their growth. But then he did something even more clever, which is he looked at the size of those effects. So that is the length of the red arrows. And what he did is he looked at all those different species and how long they had been present in New Zealand. What he was able to show was that the longer a species was present in New Zealand, the more negative its feedback became. And so this suggests that enemy escape may have happened initially, that when the species first came to New Zealand, maybe they didn't show negative feedback. But over the time that they've been present, the soil has become less and less hospitable, probably through a buildup of pathogens. Now, Jeff's study was limited because he didn't actually look at, didn't do any DNA work, didn't actually look at what was driving this pattern. It's just a phenomenological study. So we've been looking um, at various studies, looking at pathogen communities. Uh, I'm just going to highlight one here, which is a study we did going out and sampling near CAS, which is our, our field research site. It's a pretty heavily invaded grassland. About 60% of the cover is not native. And so uh, one of my students, Michelle Vischer, and a postdoc, uh, Warwick Allen, went out and they sampled grasses from across that whole site. There were three native grasses, a pretty wide range of exotic grasses, took the, them back to the lab, cultured the fungi, and then did Sanger sequencing to uh, figure out what species of fungi were present. And so what, he's, what I'm showing you here is the grass species on the bottom, uh, native and exotic, the fungi on the top, and in gray, we've got the pathogens. And what should jump out at you right away is that there are a few very, very widespread uh, uh, pathogens in the system. And also, if you look at these connections, that those exotic species are really well integrated into that network. In fact, we found no difference in the fungal community associating with the natives and exotics, and no difference in the diversity of fungi associated with natives and exotics. So again, contradicting the idea of enemy escape. What we did find was something far more intriguing though. If we looked at specificity, that is what proportion of the pathogens on a particular grass species were only found on that grass species. In native grasses, it was nearly 30%. In the exotic species, it was much, it was four and a half times lower. So we saw that the exotic species, although the overall community was not different, they were associating primarily with the generalists in that community, and they had very few specific associations. That theme of exotics associating with widespread generalists is going to come up over and over again as I go through the next couple examples. Now I'm going to briefly talk about a study that we didn't, it wasn't in my lab group, but it was done by a couple of colleagues, Jennifer Bufford and Phil Hume. And what they did is they, they wanted to look at the networks more broadly. So they actually went out and used pre-existing uh, collection data uh, from databases of all the fungal plant interactions that were known in New Zealand. And they looked at it from a pathogen viewpoint. And they've got these sort of pretty but hard to interpret network diagrams. Um, on the left, we've got the alien pathogen network, and then on the right, the native pathogens. But the main finding of this study was that the alien pathogen network showed very low levels of specificity. So these were very generalist pathogens. They also showed very low levels of modularity. You didn't see a lot of tight clusters of plants being linked by, um, by different pathogens. Instead, it was sort of this broad interconnected network, much, much more general than in the native pathogen network, which again fits with what we're seeing in our actual field data from the grass study. So in terms of pathogens in, in invasion, what we see is that enemy escape may occur, but it's ephemeral. That the longer an exotic plant is present, the more negative its feedback is becoming over time. And more recently, we've shown that these exotic plants are sharing their pathogens with native plants. So that, and they're doing that by using the host generalists. So that we're seeing that those pathogens on exotics tend to be host generalists. 
Then we can talk about mutualists. We know that when pines were introduced and other tree species were introduced around the Southern hemisphere, um, they tried planting in Australia, they tried planting in South America, Africa, New Zealand, and very, very often they failed to grow. And that's actually one of the ways we learned about ectomycorrhizae was this failure of the initial attempts to grow pine in the Southern hemisphere. You contrast that with what's going on today where pines are one of our worst invasive species. They're spreading at an enormous rate. Clearly mycorrhizae, are, although they may have been limiting in the past, there is no evidence of mycorrhizal limitation today. They are just ripping across the landscape. And so we've been looking at the fungal partners here for some time. Um, I'm gonna highlight one fairly recent study that was actually, I think Sarah's in the audience, um, but it was done by Sarah Sapsford, who was a postdoc with me at the time. And so she went out and sampled uh, across the gradient of pine invasion. So along the bottom of the graph, the x-axis, she's got increasing levels of pinus nigra biomass measured as basal area. And then the shade shows you how much of the different fungi was present. So at the very low levels of biomass, this is pretty much an open grassland just being invaded. What we see is suilis coming in, and that's that's expected. That's that's driving invasions worldwide. But then what you see is this diversification and proliferation of the fungal community, in particular, cystotrema, which is this little uh, white crust on pine needles, comes in, becomes the dominant on pines through most of the invasion. Ammonita, tilospora, lots of other fungi coming in, and so. Contrary to any idea of it being limited by mutualists, instead we see this increasing diversity of ectomycorrhizae through time. Um, still pretty low levels, going from maybe three species in the grassland up to um, you know six or seven uh, once the pines are dense. But it appears certainly sufficient to, to support the rapid growth of pine that we see. But all is not good on the biodiversity front. Um, what's happening is although there is that small increase in ectomycorrhizal diversity, at the same time, what we see is this huge loss of overall fungal diversity. So this is looking at soil fungi and we're losing over half the fungal species at a local scale. I mentioned that's alpha diversity, so in any one spot. Beta diversity is a measurement of how homogeneous the site is. And we do see that um, it becomes, or how heterogeneous the site is, it becomes more heterogeneous initially. That's because you've got isolated pines. And so they're, they're sort of making things more variable, but that falls away pretty quickly. And it looks like beta diversity might continue to decline as pine invasion goes on. So that the ecosystem is becoming very uniform and very low diversity. And we see this too in these figures um, that as the pine basal area increases, the fungal community is being increasingly dominated by a few species of ectomycorrhizal fungi on the left. And then on the right, um, we've done ordination. The light colors are sort of the open grassland sites. The dark colors are more the, uh, the pine invaded sites. And you see that those communities are both shifting in space and also becoming more similar to each other. The size of the spread of the points is becoming much smaller. So again, supporting that idea that as invasives come in, they are homogenizing the community. Now, pines are great. I've published a fair number of papers on pines, but there are other invasive ectomycorrhizal plants. Um, so I'll just highlight a couple of those. Uh, this was a study we did with Laura Bogar, um, who went on to Stanford, and I don't remember where she is today, but um, fabulous person to work with. She came down and sampled alder and willow, both of which are ectomycorrhizal, and both of which are invading together along some rivers. And I'll just show one result from her. When we looked at the fungal community, what we found was that alder had a fairly specific community of fungi, as you might expect. Willow had a lot more species in the yellow and red. But when we classified those by where they came from, um, and that's this, this red box that I've got, they were all classified as either being uh, invasive, not native, or being ones that we didn't know for sure, but we were pretty sure they were invasive. So I'm pretty confident in saying that 100% of the fungi that are associating with this, these two invasive species are also not native, just like we're seeing in the pines. Lastly, I'll show an exception to the rule. This is Holly Moeller, um, who went on to Stanford. Uh, she came down during her PhD to do some work, and she looked specifically at Douglas fir. Now, Douglas fir is a really interesting invasive plant. It's taken off in recent years. Um, unlike most other invasives, Douglas fir will invade into native forest. 
uh, it's quite shade tolerant. And so Holly went out and sampled it from grasslands, uh, from under Douglas fir plantations, and also from in the native forest to see what the fungal community looked like. And here the story is more complex. Um, what I've done here is I got all the fungal species she found across the bottom, grassland, plantation, and native forest as you go up. And the blues, the blue bars are native endemic fungi. So there are some native endemics that are occurring on Douglas fir. There are also a number of, of native species that are, are wide, that have wide distributions, cosmopolitan distributions uh, that we're finding on Douglas fir. But even here, where we do see some novel associations with native species, it's still true that even for Douglas fir, the real drivers of the invasion are these alien fungi co-invading. Now I could keep doing this, um, but it's a lot of work uh, to do all the molecular work to characterize these fungal communities. And so a different approach, uh, this is similar to what um, Jennifer did in her study, is to look at existing collections. And we're fortunate that we have a fungal foray every year. People come together, collect mushrooms, and we give them a standardized form to record their observations, and we ask them to write down what plant it was under. And so we could take all of that existing data and look at plant fungal associations. And when we do it, we get this sort of horrible spaghetti of, of a diagram. But what it shows, um, all these squares around the outside are foreign, are non-native species, alien tree genera that were in the data set. And the circles are th there's, um, represent the four native genera of ectomycorrhizal plants. Each species is linked by all these lines. Those represent the different uh, fungi. So each, each link is a shared fungal partner that was found on more than one tree. And we can plug this into a modularity analysis. It looks for patterns within the data. And what the modularity analysis came back with is shown by the colors. So all of the exotic species are shown to be tightly interlinked with each other, all forming a single module um, with one exception. And it's sort of the exception that proves the rule. That's eucalyptus or gum trees, which actually are associating with our native eucalyptus, uh, le uh, Kunzia and Leptospermum which makes some sense because they're all in the same uh, group. So we see them linking, linking into a native fungal community, but they're the only exotic tree that does so. And then our Lophazonia and Fuscospora, oops, sorry about that. Um, I will just give up on that. The Lophazonia and Fuscospora are, each have their own module. They each have quite specific fungal communities. I'll just move through that again. Okay. Um, so what do we find overall? In terms of the invasion story, what we show is that mutualist limitation is no longer limiting invasive species, just as enemy escape is no longer helping them. Uh, Co-invasion of fungal partners is common, but what we're seeing is a homogen homogenization of the fungal community and a loss of network modularity. And because we're seeing all these generalist fungi coming in, it suggests that, that could contribute to a risk of further invasion that any new ectomycorrhizal species, ectomycorrhizal tree coming into the system is likely to find compatible partners and just become part of this huge um, module interacting with all the other uh, ectomycorrhizal trees. And if you want to call that invasional meltdown, it's a bit of a jargon there, but um, it's probably a pretty good example of invasional meltdown. Now let's switch topics. Uh, I want to talk about land use change because land use change is actually really similar to invasive species. Uh, you have monocultures or low diversity plant communities of primarily exotic species. So it looks a lot like an invasion. Um, to study these, we went, we did a, a project called the Next Generation Biodiversity Assessment. This was work that I did when I was at Menaki Fenua at Landcare Research and then carried on after I left there. Um, sample plots across all of New Zealand. And then they, they were spanning five different land uses. So I'll put the key down the right-hand side. We had natural forests in the black dot, planted forest, which is mostly pine, low producing grasslands, high producing grasslands, and perennial crops, which for the most part were vineyards, um, although there are some orchards in there as well. For each one, we had a really rigorous sampling technique. Um, we had 75 plots total. They were on a uh, eight kilometer grid, randomly selected. And then we had really formalized rules about whether they'd be allowed to be sampled or not, um, what the conditions had to be met. Once we found the points, we also delineated the boundaries of a contiguous management unit. 
and then put two additional plots in some of them to allow us to look at beta diversity or how variable things were within um, a single area. From each plot, we went out and sampled soil. Um, so 24 soil cores from every plot for uh, soil DNA and for root DNA. And we also extracted the, the soil animals. Um, and then we did something somewhat unusual. We clipped leaves all through the plot. We, just a timed search, clipping as many different species as possible uh, to look at foliar associated microbes. And pretty much it's your standard meta barcoding, throw all the, all the, everything into a tube and see what you get. Um, we looked at fungi, bacteria, umycetes, uh, animals, and plants, and end up with a huge data set, about 23 million DNA sequences. Um, so pretty interesting challenge to analyze, but I'll, I'll skip, skip boring you with that bit. So what did we find? Um, I'm going to show, show a lot of the data like this. This is an ordination. It's just looking at composition. Uh, and again, the key is down the right-hand side. And this is looking at soil DNA and, fung and just the fungal community. And what you see is that the black spots, the, the natural forest, separates out really nicely from most of the other land uses. The, pine, the planted forest sits a little bit off to one side, really distinct. And then the other three land uses sort of go in order from low producing grassland to high producing grassland to the perennial crops with bigger, larger and larger shifts in the fungal community. And of course, we did that across substrates. So we looked at soil, we looked at roots, and we looked at leaves, and they all show the same patterns, uh, more or less. And we also looked at bacteria, not quite as clean as fungi, but pretty much exactly the same story. And in fact, that was true of everything. When we looked at umycetes, when we looked at uh, animals, when we looked at plants, it tended to be that same order. So I'll just summarize that. This was the order that went from natural forest to planted forest, and then low producing grasslands, high producing grasslands, and perennial crops. And if you really want a statistic, you can take those ordinations and you can do something called Procrustes rotation. And what you find is that they're all highly significantly correlated with each other with R squares between about 0.37 and 0.6. So pretty good correlation that all the communities shift in the same way with land use change. That's not true of diversity. So when we looked at the number of species found as our number of plots increased, for soil DNA, a fungi you found pretty much what you might expect, that indigenous forests had the highest diversity, although somewhat surprisingly planted forests had the lowest diversity. But as you looked across the different groups, that pattern wasn't repeated, um, or at least wasn't always repeated. Instead, we saw that while indigenous forest was the most diverse community for soil fungi. It was actually the least diverse for soil bacteria. And some ecosystems like planted forests tended to be fairly low diversity, but then when you looked at, at bacteria on the leaf surfaces, uh, they were actually the highest diversity of any of our systems for that. So looking across and just doing the rank order of the different land uses for these different uh, taxa and different substrates, there's nothing consistent. It, they jump around in every which direction. Maybe perennial crops tended to be low, but, but you couldn't reliably predict it. So we started thinking a lot about diversity. And one of the things I'm really interested in, I've been pushing for a while, is the idea of rarity. So rarity is asking what proportion of the species in a plot are rare. Um, and by rare, you can define it in different ways, but I define it as being that they're found in less than 5% of my samples. And just to illustrate that, this is a bit juvenile. I'm showing emojis. This is how I teach statistics is with emojis. Um, but here are three different communities, community one, two, and three. Uh, communities one and two both have 10 different emojis or species in them. Community three only has eight. So you'd say it's lower diversity. You can use a Shannon diversity-based index. And um, again, community one would be really high Shannon diversity. Community two, a little bit lower because you've got, uh, it's not as evenly uh, divided up. And community three, really low. But if you looked at rarity, you'd get exactly the opposite pattern. In fact, rarity, that is those species that are found in only one of the three sites, um, in this case, is high in community three. It's got four species. The other ones are pretty much overlapped with, the, with each other. And if you, it may seem like a strange metric, but if you were trying to conserve species diversity, you really wouldn't necessarily want to conserve richness or species diversity. You want to conserve rarity. You want to find those habitats that support the most unique uh, species. In the case of our data, 
when we apply that, remember there was no consistent pattern in species richness or diversity, but when we look at rare species there is, we see across almost all of the different groups that rare species are most frequent in the natural forest, the unmodified ecosystems, and then they decline with increasing land use intensification. So that's tying into this idea of a change in the co-occurrence networks that we're losing these specialist interactions. And it's very similar to what we're seeing um, in the pathogen community of losing host specialists. We also looked at beta diversity. Another way, remember that we had those three uh, plots within each management unit. And when we look at the variability across those plots, so this is measured as beta diversity, again, what we see is the effect of land use change is a decline in beta diversity. Looking more specifically at pathogens, because one of our big interests, uh, my student Andy Macchiola uh, sort of pulled out that part of the data for further analysis. And here, when we look at diversity, what we found was that the uh, natural forest or indigenous forest always had the lowest diversity of pathogens and substantially lower than the other ecosystems, whereas the productive ecosystems had usually about twice as many species of pathogenic fungi, bacteria, and sometimes way more than twice as many species of um, umycetes. Now, land use change is complicated. Um, why we, well, I can't just say that's because there were exotic plants there, um, because people modify these ecosystems with herbicide, they put on pesticides, they add fertilizer, they're plowing the ground, they're irrigating, any one of those things could be contributing to pathogens. The other problem with this data is that it's not, it's not it, where people put a land use isn't random on the landscape. You don't put a uh, dairy paddock on the top of a mountain. Um, and so we had to account for those other drivers of pathogen communities. So what Andy did is he did a path analysis. He considered the effect of climate, of geomorphology, of the actual land use, the soil, the plant community, all those drivers to see which of those were actually driving plant pathogen communities. Um, and this is, again, I'm gonna focus just on fungi for on leaves for a minute. This is one way to look at it. Here's that path diagram. And I've, I've increased the thickness of the line proportional to how important it is. And what the path analysis showed was a very, very strong link between pa plant pathogens and the plant community. And the plant community then was being driven by land use. So although we can incorporate these other drivers, it's really that exotic plant dominance that's driving the changes in the pathogen community. And we see that not only in the leaves, we see that across the roots and the soil as well. It's always the plant community driving the, the uh, pathogens. And we again, we see the same pattern mostly for everything. Uh, the only exception being umycetes on the leaves. Everything else, what we see is uh, the pathogen community is linked through the plant community. We can show that a bit more quantitative, the proportion of variants explained in the different um, communities. And what you can see is this green color is the most uh, is the most important driver for every group of pathogens on every substrate. That's the plant community. Um, this white box will be the second most, that's collinearity. So we can't fully tease it apart, but in, in most cases, that's actually more plant effect, but interacting with some of the other drivers. So if we put that together, what is land use change doing? We're seeing consistent shifts in composition of all uh, life, but no consistent pattern in species numbers. Sometimes diversity goes up, sometimes it goes down. However, in every case, what we see is a loss of rare species. So we're seeing a homogenization of the, of the fungal and other communities. We're also seeing a really high diversity of pathogens, consistent with the idea of exotics actually building up pathogens um, in these productive land uses, and that those changes in pathogens are very much linked to the exotic plant species. But path analysis aside, it's still an observational study. And observational studies are everything we've done so far. Everything we've talked about is observational. It's, it doesn't separate cause and effect clearly. So what we needed was to do a proper um, experiment. And this was a huge undertaking. It was led by Lauren Waller and Warwick Allen um, 
what they did uh, was go out and build mesocosms. They actually built 180 sort of large pots, each one of which was planted with eight different plant species um, in 20 different communities that they assembled. There were a total of almost 40 different plant species involved um, to draw from. And then they were arranged so that we had them from zero to 100% exotic plants. And we were interested in grasslands to shrublands. So we went from zero to 60% woody plants, every possible combination in this, in this diagram. Warwick uh, led the above ground component. So that's, that gives you a sense of the scale of the mesocosms as there are pots. And then Warwick put these cages over them to contain herbivores. So um, I know we're supposed to be talking about fungi, but I'll talk about herbivores a little bit. He introduced 20 different species of herbivores, um, both exotics and natives mostly generalists, but all sorts of different feeding types. So what did we see in terms of the pathogens? Um, well, Lauren had a couple questions. One of them was, do exotic plants accumulate generalist pathogens? Um, and then do they then share those pathogens with natives? So to answer the first question, at the end of the experiment, we actually had to harvest these, which is a bit heartbreaking. That's what they looked like. That's a native dominated mesocosm after the end of the growth period. Uh, pulled out all the root systems. So we ended up with 1,440 root systems that all had to be processed and then did meta barcoding on each root system individually and used um, Fungild to put some attempt at putting a functional uh, classification on them. When we did that and we looked at native versus exotic plants, and then we looked at the proportion of the sequences that were pathogens, what we found was that the exotics, very contrary to any, any idea of enemy escape, actually had far higher levels of pathogens. So exotic plants had more pathogens on their roots than natives. We then wanted to look at the network of interactions. So Lauren looked at this using something called normalized degree, which is of all the possible connections that a plant could make through pathogens, how many of them did it actually make? And here you see that the exotic plants have a much higher level of, or a much higher normalized degree than the native plants, indicating that they're interacting with more generalist associations. So do exotic plants accumulate generalist pathogens? The answer is yes, and they do so more than the native plants. But do they actually share these? Is there any possibility of them actually allowing pathogens spill over back to the natives? So when you look at a uh, community, we could have a pathogen that was only on exotics. We could have one that was only on natives, but we were interested in quantifying those that were found on both. So what I'll do is graph this as sort of the, the amount of exotic plants on the x-axis um, and then the proportion of shared pathogens on the y. And I'll just remind you that it's you already know what the two endpoints are, that if you've only got native plants, you can't have any sharing. So we have to start at zero. And if you've got 100% exotic plants, they can't share with natives either because there are no natives to share with. Uh, so it's also going to be zero. So we're really interested in the middle here. And so because it's quite a complicated thing, we had to do a Monte Carlo simulation. So we had to randomize the data. Um, I think we did 10,000 times or more um, and see what we would expect if sharing was just a random event. And what we that's plotted here. So in the gray, we've got something like 10,000 iterations. The model in that light gray color sort of piled up on top of each other. That's what you would expect if pathogens were just randomly distributing, sharing equally between the two plants. What we actually see is a deviation from that. So in the black line is our actual data, and you can see it's substantially below most of the randomizations at low levels of exotic dominance. And then it actually goes way above so we're seeing more sharing than you would expect once exotics become dominant. And we can actually just make that a little easier to see as a deviation from what you'd expect at random. And you can see there's that low, that low levels of exotics, there's less sharing than you'd expect, but then it's compensated by oversharing um, when you've got a high level of exotics. So do exotics share pathogens with native plants? Absolutely, yes. And they're doing so more than native plants. Again, I apologize for talking about herbivores, but because it supports the same story, I think it's worth including. Uh, so this was Warwick's work. Um, Warwick looked at the probability of the plants interacting with an uh, herbivore and also the biomass of that herbivore per plant. In both cases, the exotics were more likely to interact and they had more biomass 
of herbivores. So just like the pathogens, exotics are accumulating herbivores. The biomass of herbivores showed a really interesting pattern. The native herbivores were present in every mesocosm. They really didn't care if, this, if the plants were native or not, but the exotic herbivores were increasing. The more, the more exotic plants were present, the more it was increasing these exotic herbivores. And because of that, what we saw was the actual effect of exotic plants in the community was to increase the diversity of herbivores, just like they're increasing the diversity of pathogens. Perhaps unsurprisingly, given those results, the exotics are suffering more damage, which sounds like a good thing. Maybe the herbivores are going to prevent the invasion from happening, but unfortunately, that's not what happens. Um, what we see is they do reduce the biomass of exotics. So on the right, I've got exotics, on the left, natives. Uh, and then without herbivores in the pink and with herbivores in the green, and you, it is lower, it, it does go down. Um, but if you look at the proportion of the final biomass that was exotics, um, if it was shared equally, it'd be this dashed line. And in every case, whether you have herbivores or don't have herbivores, it was always uh, dominated by exotic plants. So that exotic plants are accumulating the herbivores, but tolerating them. They're still able to dominate the mesocosms. We also, we also looked at the network. Um, so Warwick used a slightly different measure called uh, potential for apparent competition or PAC. It measures the, the chance of a, of a plant increasing an herbivore that could attack another plant. And what that showed was that exotic plants had a very high potential to exert um, apparent competition and also for a slightly higher chance of receiving it. But so it means that is again an indication of generality that the, the herbivores that are increasing on exotic plants are those that are likely to affect other plants. The last bit of data I'll show, I just want to get back to fungi. I uh, didn't want to end on herbivores. So uh, our most recent results is we pulled out the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungal DNA from these systems. Um, so this was work by John Romana, who just finished his PhD last year. And he was looking at mycorrhizal diversity in individual plants. And what he found is that across that gradient, as you increase the proportion of exotic species on the x-axis, the species diversity of our buscum mycorrhizae is actually going down, um, sort of the opposite of what we're seeing with pathogens. But again, that same pattern that I said you'd see over and over again is shown here. This is looking at a measurement of generality, that is how many partners did each fungus have. Um, and what we see is that as the proportion of exotics is, is increasing, we see that the network is becoming much more generalist. We're losing those specialists out of the network. So from the mesocosms, what we're seeing is exotic plants are accumulating both pathogens and herbivores. We're seeing a declining diversity of mycorrhizal partners. And overall, those interaction networks of both pathogens and mutualists are becoming more generalist. Despite those high loads of pathogens and herbivore load, the exotics are actually dominating the communities. And because of that, there's this high potential that those high biomass exotics are gonna build up communities of pathogens, build up communities of herbivores, which may then spill over back to the natives, having a detrimental effect on the native biodiversity. So that's a lot, and uh, sorry to hit you with that much data all at once over lunch, but the reason I did it is I want to show the similarities of patterns that we're seeing across this wide range of studies and how all these little pieces are starting to tell a coherent story. We're seeing really, really strong similarities between invasion and land use change. And in both cases, what we're seeing is that exotic plants are associated with increased abundance and diversity of pathogens and herbivores. That's being driven by a combination of co-invasion, which is particularly common in ectomycorrhizal plants, but also host generalist uh, species, which might be more common in our buscomycorrhizae or in some of the pathogens. We don't have enough data to really uh, say for sure there. In terms of community level effects, uh, the effects on alpha diversity are unpredictable. Sometimes diversity goes up and sometimes it goes down, but what we do see is a very consistent loss of beta diversity or rarity or, or heterogeneity. So that as you move from place to place, the community is predictable. It's not changing as much as you would expect. In terms of the network, 
the interaction network is becoming less modular, better interconnected, and we're seeing an increase in generalist interactions. That's ironic because most people who study interaction networks study native ecosystems. And these changes in a native ecosystem would be seen as good because when a system becomes less modular and has more generalist interactions, it becomes more resilient to change. The problem is in the context of invasives, having a high resilience to change means it's gonna be harder to restore these ecosystems back to native. It means that once they once these interaction networks are are established, they're going to enter what we call hysteresis, which means it takes a, a high energy to move it back to the native state, and that may explain why we have a pretty high failure rate when we try to actually restore these ecosystems. It's very hard to remove the exotics and get it back to what we want in the first place. So I hate to end on a, a low note, but what do I see as the future of Aotearoa New Zealand? Um, I think we're not. We're going to have diverse communities, but they're going to be repetitive plant fungal networks. We're going to see the same plants and same fungi everywhere um, and lose that, that heterogeneity and rarity. Um, and further, the, the increase in, in pathogens, the increase in mutualists that we're seeing uh, is probably going to lead to ecosystems that are more prone to further invasion and that are resistant to restoration because this, the network structure is a highly resilient structure. And on that very, very cheerful note, I just want to acknowledge that I've done very little of this work. It's all been done by, by my team. Um, Sarah, Warwick, Lauren, uh, Andy, Zach, uh, lots of other people as well. Um, and also with my collaborators <clears throat> in bioprotection, Menaki Fenua and at the University of Canterbury. And lastly, I'll just note, I do have a postdoctoral position uh, available right now, which is advertised. Um, I think it closes at the end of April um, or let's say mid-April. Um, and if you, want, if you want more details, just email me or there's a, a link here. And with that, I am happy to end and uh, take any questions. Thank you very much, Ian. That was really awesome. Though it was a bit sad that higher resilience is not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> it sort of changes your view, doesn't it? It really does, because that's what a lot of us are trying to go yeah. for, isn't it? Especially in the climate change area. Well, we're um, getting resilient ecosystems. They're just not the plants that we wanted. <laughs> There you go. Um, for those who are in the audience, if you uh, want to pop questions into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, um, that would be good. Um, while we're waiting for that, I have a question for Ian. Now, you were talking about sharing of different fungi between the exotics and the natives, um, and you talked quite a bit about pathogens. You talked a little bit about mutualists. So the Douglas fir example was really interesting, you know, that they were beginning to share some mutualists with natives. Did you actually look at the structure of the roots, as in, are they ectomycorrhizal fungi that are being shared? Are they actually forming what you would expect structure-wise in the roots? Uh, we, yeah, they're, they're I mean, they are forming ectomycorrhizae. Yeah. Okay, they are. Um, so we are, we're, yeah, absolutely classic ectomycorrhizae. Um, have we actually shown physical connections between a native plant and an exotic plant? No, and I don't expect we will. Um, I don't. I, I tend to be skeptical that, that would actually matter as much as just providing the inoculum. Yeah, so. totally. And one ex, one follow on from that, from your um, diagram that you had from the fungal forays, where you were showing the links between the different exotics, um, and you were saying that eucalyptus, um, the fungal networks, or the fungal co-occurrence with eucalyptus and leptospermum made sense, which I agree with. But there seemed to be a lot of connections between leptospermum and pine, if I if I was understanding that correctly. Um, do, you, do you remember the slide that I mean? Yeah, yeah. I could try to flick back, but it's about 60 slides ago. Yes, so it is. <laughs> um, uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, what exact fungi those would be, I'd have to go look back to the data. Um, I mean, the biggest shared one we see between uh, the Nothophagus and pine is Amanita muscaria, which okay. is probably one of them. But that, that one we have not yet seen on Kanuka and Manuka. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I'd have to go back and search up the data. I don't have it at my fingertips, so. Yeah, I was kind of curious about that just because some of the stuff that seems to be appearing on pine over here would be something that you might think of as on eucalyptus as well. And, and that's kind of had us scratching our heads as, is it actually there or is it 
spore, you know, build up in the soils or something like that that's actually on the roots. That's why I was asking if you had been looking yeah. at the most, actual. Yeah, most of our work, most of that work was done with plucking off individual ectomycorrhizal roots and then mm -hmm. doing cell resequencing. So I'm pretty confident that it's not just spores in the soil. I think if you're doing uh, soil DNA, then you've got a bigger problem because you're right, you're going to pick up all sorts of stuff. Um, yeah. But yeah. Cool. Rita has a question now in the Q&A. How does the contrast among native versus different land uses in New Zealand compare with other parts of the world, such as Europe or North America, where invasion has been going on for much longer? That's a really good question, Rita. Um, first of all, hi, Rita. <laughs> um, uh, I don't have an answer for it, unfortunately. Um, there is a paper uh, by Aram looking at, um, is it pine and oak in somewhere in Europe? But I, that, that does suggest it's a little bit different. Um, but yeah, sorry, I don't, I don't have as good an understanding of Europe and North America anymore as I do of New Zealand. So... Well, if there are no further questions, um, thank you again very much, Ian. That was an amazing presentation, such great work. Um, please, if you know of good people who could be a postdoc for Ian, sounds like that is an amazing opportunity for them. And New Zealand is amazing too. <laughs> so thank you very much, Ian, um, for taking pleasure. the time today. And thank you, everyone. Um, again, next month, same time, the last Wednesday of the month, we are going to have another seminar. So please stay tuned for that. So with that, thank you everyone and have a great rest of your day. Cheers.